If you've spent more than five minutes operating in the realm of American politics, and in particular right-wing American politics, then you've probably heard something to the effect of, America was built upon Christian values. Christian values are what made America great, what made America exceptional. And this is true. But because we're lazy and we enjoy the temporary perceived comforts of a secular society, we also think that this country was built upon religious freedom or something, which isn't true. That's, of course, what they tell you in public school to justify the promotion of the religions of the state, uh, Satanism, atheism, progressivism, etc. Just like, you know, in the, uh, the latter half of the 20th century, they use these ideas of free speech and free expression, man, to promote communism and degeneracy throughout the culture. Why would you ever take these people at their word? But yeah, so they tell you that the founding fathers were refugees fleeing religious persecution, just like the Muslims are now. Yeah, well, that would be like saying people who wanted to go to Five Guys instead of In-N-Out were seeking dietary freedom. They're still eating burgers, bro. Virtually every European American identified as a Christian in 1776, except for a couple thousand Jews, bro. When they say that the Constitution was written for a religious people and that it wouldn't function with any other population, they were talking about Christians, bro. It never would have occurred to them that they'd be dealing with all this other nonsense in their country, bro. But we fumbled for a century or so, and so now we have to figure this out. Oh, well, but the First Amendment says that freedom of religion and separation of church and state, no, it doesn't actually. First of all, separation of church and state is not a real thing. That's not written anywhere in any of the founding documents of this country. That is in reference to a letter that Thomas Jefferson penned in the early 1800s, but that's about it. Secondly, properly understood in terms of how our country was established, it is a separation of church from state, which means that the intent was to prevent the state from interfering with the practice of religion, specifically Christianity, which is why the First Amendment says that Congress can't establish a religion, except that it has, hasn't it? This is not exactly a fresh take, but what's the significant difference between what Congress and the federal government have done and what an official established religion would do? They have their holidays, they have their saints, their martyrs, they have their myths, their narratives, uh, they have their rituals and sacrifices, they have their slogans, prayers, even, like it's all there. And truly, I don't mean to come off as disrespectful to the non-Christians in the audience, but this is also clear to me now that I think it would actually be more disrespectful to you if I were to try to dress it up or sugarcoat it. So at the very least, I am honest, if perhaps off-putting, and there's a couple quotes that I think work well here. I can't remember to whom exactly they're attributed, but the first one is, those who think religion and politics aren't linked understand neither, and this is true, and we'll explain why as we continue, but I want you to think about that as well as this one, which you can probably relate to as someone who knows about politics, who understands what's going on, where we're headed, and you talk to your friends and family who just don't get it, and you feel like you're going crazy, right? Like you almost just want to shake them, like, like, why don't you get it? Listen to me, damn it! Like they just won't wake up. Well, it's the same thing with Christianity. It's that old saying, you know, don't ever discuss religion and politics. It's impolite. It's like, what else would you talk about? Like, once you get it, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And you can't help but talk about it because everything else just seems like a distraction. And such is, of course, the nature of knowing the truth, going down the rabbit hole. Like, you, you can never see things the same way. And lots of people would prefer to live in a state of like blissful ignorance, which is understandable, but no one can honestly return to that state once they see the truth. And so in the last video, we discussed the links between liberalism and Satanism. And this is actually technically part four of this series, the final part, because we had two prerequisite videos that explain concepts that we built off in other videos. And so I'll put links to all of the other videos in the series in the description, plus a little video called How We Let the 2010s Change Politics Forever, which explains the contrast between Christian morality and what is being promoted uh, throughout society by the Left, but in this video, we're going to cover so many important things, and so please watch all the way through, even if you disagree, so at least it can be a fair disagreement, but I think that you'll be with me on at least a few of these points, even if you disagree with the thesis of this video, which I guess I'll say now, is that if there is to be conservatism, meaning the conservation of the traditional American society, then there has to be Christianity. They are inextricably linked. You cannot have America without conservatism, and you cannot have conservatism without Christianity simply because America was built by Christianity. If you try to run this system without Christianity, you are setting yourself up for failure. And so now we will explain why Christian philosophy is the opposite of leftist philosophy and why they'll always be at odds with each other, why the Constitution seemingly failed, why the Second Amendment seemingly failed, uh, the truth about liberal Christianity, how liberal democracy hides its tyranny and maintains its power, how religion is inevitable, how the immaterial was transformed into the material to allow for evil, why Christian virtue is absolutely necessary for young men to successfully take their country back, how we're all going to die, how to prepare for that part, including the part where I give you a free book if you want it. So this is also important. So do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, commie. 
Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Kami. I hope you all had a fantastic Thanksgiving, and we are now going to get into some very important topics that I think will answer a lot of questions that we've all had in the backs of our minds, but that we didn't really think to ask or quite know how to articulate, especially in terms of the Constitution and the Second Amendment. Because as I've gotten older and I've thought about things more, it's been very difficult for me to buy into this conservative tendency to sort of, you know, idolize the Constitution and the Second Amendment. Oh, well, the problem is we just didn't listen to the Constitution. Well, the Second Amendment is the only reason we'll never have a tyrannical government. Like, I, I promise you, I promise you that you can't provide to me an objection that I haven't already thought of. And I would urge you instead to consider how honestly you can still say these things after the last two or so years of the American experience. And when we talk momentarily about the actual nature of how our government maintains power and the Constitution and the Second Amendment, I think that you'll find that discussion to be much more satisfying than the same tired excuses that we've heard from the bumper sticker crowd. But anyways, given that this country was built by Christian men, to which of course the objection is always going to be, well, this guy had an affair. Well, well, this guy did a bad thing. Yeah, but he probably repented for it and at least acknowledged that it was wrong. Whereas your faction seeks to usher in evil through the abandonment of the immaterial by publishing articles saying, well, science says there's nothing wrong with casual sex. Well, science says morality is subjective. We're going to dissect this a little bit later, but in summary, you're stupid. The point being that this country was built by men who were virtually all Christian, with a handful of exceptions, if that. And because of this, Christianity was the dominant religion and had the primary impact on the ethics, the culture, and the politics of this nation. And this calls back to the quote from earlier, that those who think that religion and politics aren't linked understand neither. And this is true because what religion is, by definition, is an understanding of how things are. And what politics is, by definition, is an understanding of how things ought to be. And if you understand how things are, then you necessarily understand how things ought to be because your understanding of how things are informs that. This is why anyone who claims to be a Christian and who says things like, well, I don't let my religion inform my political beliefs is misguided because what they're basically doing is masturbating to this idea of the comfortable, unbiased, secular society and their allegiance to that above their allegiance to their literal creator, which is a form of pride, which of course is a sin. They refuse to sacrifice their public perception by taking the unpopular but still correct approach by acknowledging that religious beliefs and political beliefs are necessarily intertwined. And they instead opt to maintain this farce of impartiality because they think it makes them appear smarter, more educated, more just, more balanced, or whatever. My case was somewhat unique. My politics actually came first. And then I realized that Christianity was identical to my moral compass. And then I read in the Bible that God inscribes morality onto all of our hearts. And I was like, oh, that's how that happened. Like I always just strongly detested degenerate behavior, just instinctively. I am instinctively based because my parents never really sat me down and said, you know, don't do this, don't do that. The schools kind of just stood back while these things were happening or they enabled them indirectly. It was always just a very strong instinct that I had that I could not explain before I read the Bible. And something else to keep in mind is that the left does not separate their politics and their religion. Like their religion, though maybe not as official as Christianity, 100% informs their politics and it always will. So what's the religion of the left, so to speak? Even the people on the left who claim to be Christians would actually find themselves more closely aligned with this than with a proper understanding of Christianity. And this, broadly speaking, is something called humanism, which is the idea that man has supreme authority rather than nature or God. And the progression of mankind is the ultimate purpose of all human action. And this is important because the political manifestation of humanism is simply socialism, because humanism, as a rejection of nature and an elevation of man, seeks to eliminate any form of inequality between people. So think about it this way. God God created human beings and God created nature. God is at the top of the hierarchy above human beings and the nature which God created has certain people better at certain things, man different from woman, etc. Therefore, Christianity and the worship of God, conservatism, true meritocracy, true freedom, order, masculinity, these are all things that are right wing. All of these things are related, they are all intertwined and they are all necessary for the societal propagation of each other. And the opposites would be things like atheism, Satanism, socialism, communism. This concept of equality, equity, chaos, uh, femininity or androgyny, equality of outcome. These are all things that are left-wing and they are all intertwined and they are all reliant upon each other for their respective societal propagation. And what I'm going to try to articulate today is that all of the adjacent things on both the right and the left are ultimately dependent upon one thing, the most important thing which is simply the presence or the absence of God, or I should say the worship of God or the worship of the self. This is why Christian philosophy is the opposite of leftist philosophy. Think about it. Conservatism, conserving a society that was safe, free, moral, and prosperous. 
that had God's blessing, that was one nation under God, whose framework of government was designed to operate only for a religious, hear that as Christian population, that is so obviously and unambiguously indicative of the necessity of Christianity. Whereas the rejection, the opposite, the rejection of masculinity and femininity, the, the rejection of hierarchy, of nature, etc., all of that is only possible with the rejection of God. That's why we lose. We don't even believe in what we're talking about anymore. We have a God-sized hole in this country. We talk about Christianity. We talk about Christian values, but nobody wants to have faith anymore. No one wants to believe what they're saying. If there is to be conservatism, there has to be Christianity. The society that you're trying to conserve was that way because of Christianity. You don't even necessarily have to believe all the time. Many don't. That's what faith is. It is choosing to believe, not just acknowledging that the bridge exists, but choosing to trust it by walking across it. Not every Christian feels the presence of God at all times. And most Christians find themselves questioning their faith from time to time. But what's important is the choice. That is what faith is. But we don't have faith, and so we lose. Look at how the left takes to the streets, how they scream, how their entire lives are dedicated to the religions of the state. That energy is very real. It's nothing to be pointed and laughed at. And it's being driven by evil forces. And this calls back to John Milton's depiction of Satan that we discussed in the last video, because Milton's Satan believed that it was better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. And fundamentally, the leftist is a person who wholeheartedly believes that it is better to reign in hell, whereas right-wing people tend to believe that it would be better to serve in heaven. Once again, this is the rejection versus the acknowledgement of hierarchy. And because the left fundamentally rejects all hierarchies because they are prideful and because they are narcissistic and each wants to be the rulers of their own hell, that is exactly what they create with their efforts and their energies. Think about it. Jordan Peterson used to say this, that you can often infer someone's intentions by observing the outcomes of their actions. Everything the left touches becomes ugly, it becomes backwards, it becomes perverted, it becomes unnatural, it becomes wrong. This is the closest thing that we could imagine to hell on earth, a place where everyone is the ruler because no one or no thing is the ruler. Nothing is beautiful, nothing is good because everything is relative and resultantly everything is actually terrible. And now we live in chaos and despair. And whether it's racial issues, sexual issues, economic issues, it doesn't matter. The left will always possess that same metaphysical impulse, that same satanic impulse which says, I don't want anyone above me and I will bring about hell on earth in order to get my desires. Now, contrast that with the metaphysical impulse of the right. We, sure, reject the satanic impulse of the left, but we also don't exactly embrace the nightly impulse of Christianity that we are called to embrace, which actually enables evil to propagate through our inaction. So what are we even doing? We don't act because we don't actually believe in anything. The same way that the leftist believes in himself above everything else, the conservative does not believe in himself at all. But this is not because he necessarily believes in something greater than himself, which could compel him to strive towards it maybe in the past, but rather because he doesn't even believe in himself enough to trust that he could even know what that is anymore. He has become conditioned into the secular framework and he's been very comfortable there for quite some time. But as he relaxed under that illusion of maintaining moral neutrality throughout society, maintaining the power vacuum throughout society, some very dark and ancient things, which were only suppressed by proactive godly and knightly moralism, they're creeping back into society, just like they have many times throughout the history of the world. And our sense of false comfort has left us quite unprepared for what is currently happening and definitely for what's going to happen next. But of course, before we get into what's going to happen next, hear me out on this because men are being inundated with overpriced boxers designed for testosterone deficient men. This is not a joke. This is not even a sales pitch. If you are wearing underwear from these mainstream brands that use polyester, you are literally lowering your testosterone because chemicals are absorbing into your balls through this fabric. Again, this is a fact. You have to keep in mind, all of our sponsors are huge fans of the content, which is why we get away with saying whatever we want, but also why we're not trying to sell you like, you know, obscure supplements or insurance policies or whatever. The point being, under attack is epic. It's where I got the boxers I'm wearing right now. It's where I got this t-shirt with St. Michael the Archangel on it, except he's got an AR-15 this time. Sword of St. Michael, AR-15 of St. Michael. They're all getting thirstier by the day, and our tremendous and wonderful God will give them an ocean of blood to drink upon his return. <clears throat> Anyways, you know the drill. They're durable. They're comfortable. There's a secret tactical pocket uh, in the back. They're antibacterial, anti-peeling, anti-communist, anti-shrink. Uh, they're lightweight, breathable, also important. Plus, they're 30% less expensive than the competition. So go to Undertack or getundertack.com. That's getundertack.com right now as a special introductory offer. Buy three, get one free with the offer code DOYLE. That's four pairs for the same price as two from the competition. Satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. This man is your friend. He fights for the comfort of your private party. Parts, get under tack.com, offer, offer code DOYLE, very epic. We continue. 
So the last thing I want to talk about before getting into the stuff that I think is the most interesting is that you cannot be a Christian and be a liberal. And whenever you do any sort of gatekeeping like this, people get defensive. They start melting down like, well, you think just because someone doesn't agree with your definition, well, they can't be this thing, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, because it's not my definition. It's the definition. It's not like it's some club or something. We're not telling you you can't sit at the lunch table. It's a very calm and rational explanation like, oh, well, yeah, if you believe this, then by definition, you are not this. It's really that simple. And of course, we must remember, and you can take this to the bank endorsed by the CEO of conservative gatekeeping, that the only people who get upset about gatekeeping are the people who the gate was supposed to keep out in the first place. But anyways, there are three reasons that you cannot be both a liberal and a Christian. Those reasons starting from the top of the pyramid and trickling down are the ethos of liberalized Christianity, the theory of liberalism, and the implications of both in practice. And the most obvious of the three is what this looks like in practice, and we go into this in much greater detail in those other videos that I mentioned, but you cannot operate within the left-wing coalition that is promoting everything that is the most antithetical to Christianity in our society and still call yourself a Christian. You just can't. The mental gymnastics are too advanced. It really is that simple. So why do they ignore this? Well, that gets into the ethos of it. But before that, the second reason, what liberalism is in theory, it is a prioritization of the self above all outside constraints. This is inherently antithetical to Christianity, which makes objective declarations about morality, about nature, about God, etc. And it is, of course, liberalism in theory, which leads to what we see in practice from the global left, which we correctly identified in the last video as the greatest political force for Satanism in the history of the world, because there's virtually no difference between the doctrines of liberalism and the doctrines of Satanism. Again, as we proved in the previous video, so watch that if you need the explanation. But finally, the top of the pyramid, which enables these mental gymnastics, which allows for these so-called Christian liberals to keep doing this, it is the ethos of liberalized Christianity. True Christianity, which you tend to see from conservatives who are Christian, is focused on sacrifice, on serving God, etc. But liberalized Christianity is focused almost exclusively on this idea of tolerance, on loving thy neighbor, on accepting people. Oh, Jesus would have been a socialist, this whole train of thought. And this is why they can ignore the fact that their coalition promotes child sacrifice, promotes the total inversion of sexual behavior, all of this nonsense, because their entire sense of being is simply making excuses for other people's behavior and absolutely refusing to condemn evil at risk of being intolerant. This is what liberalism is. We're all the same. And if someone does something not as well as someone else, or they break the law? Well, it's because of environmental factors. It's because of socioeconomic factors. Literally, their entire framework of thought is pathologically making excuses for individual behavior. And what liberal Christians are doing by this is they are contesting God because by absolutely refusing to condemn evil, to hold people accountable, to instead just focus on love and acceptance, they are implying through this that they are more merciful than God, which is very dangerous stuff because God will hold these people accountable eventually. And first John says that you are not to try to be more merciful than God, but that is what the entirety of liberalized Christianity is. That's the ethos of it. It is prideful. It is heretical. It is satanic. You cannot be a liberal and be a Christian. If you're a liberal, you are acting against God's will and you are claiming to do the opposite by dressing your sin up in the name of Christ. And that is not going to fare well for you. Hey, cut it out. Knock it off. You're being dumb. But we continue. Ow. Uh, to get into why our country devolved to this point and how that's related to God, we first have to understand how our country works, how the system works, and how our country operates under the system of a liberal democracy. Well, we're a constitutional republic, right? That's a form of liberal democracy. Now, the problem with this is actually even revealed in the name itself, since liberalism is dumb and democracy is cringe. So combining the two would, of course, create something via the transit of property that is dumb and cringe. So there's that. But liberal democracy was something of an experiment at the time, so I'm less concerned with debating the theory of it, more concerned with uh, what it does in practice and how its weaknesses are exploited to the detriment of the American people, etc. And a liberal democracy is very, very good at maintaining its power and hiding its tyranny. And it does this by selectively applying both implicit and explicit force. And the importance of the former cannot be overstated. I have had this argument with my dad for hours before over the phone. It's just so important to understand how our system operates and why we're never going to liberate ourselves from it by using the tools that they've provided to us, which are provided to us to justify the existence of the system. So the first thing to understand is that 99% of the political education that you have was given to you to justify the nature and the existence of the regime. Even if you think you have a piece of information that challenges the regime, chances are that if you got it from a public school or from a mainstream book or even one of the edgy and controversial ones that they don't want you to read, like 1984, Fahrenheit 451, etc., Chances are that all of that education was designed to justify the nature of the regime. And there are two examples of this in particular that I want to highlight here. 
And those are things like martial law, confiscation of firearms, et cetera, and then censorship, state-run media, et cetera. And since the regime ultimately serves the interests of the left, whether that's because they occupy it directly or because people without agency uh, and the capacity for penetrating thought are predisposed to comply with the narratives of the regime, the unwashed masses, so to speak. But in terms of how it's justified to people on the right, it goes something like this. Sure, right-wing people might dislike the incumbent class of politicians or whatever, but the solution will always be to just vote in good guys to basically try to work within the system. And I've sort of advocated for this before. I stand by that, but my cool friends and I would be making serious changes to the way the system works. But my point is that right-wing people don't often think about just how much they've lost and how they've lost it all while they were still winning elections and holding office. They just kind of have this general faith in the system because while it might not be perfect, it safeguards from tyranny, the worst possible thing in the world with the constitution. And if everyone would just listen to the constitution, then everything would be fine. This is because right-wing individuals tend to have a concept of tyranny that was taught to them in public schools and by Hollywood. Tyranny is when there's a dictator and when you can't buy things that you want and when you can't own guns and when the government censors any speech that criticizes it. And the only reason we're not there yet is because of our second amendment and that America has about 400 million guns. So as long as we have guns, tyranny won't come to America. And if it did, we'd take care of it. And as long as we don't have the state controlling media, we can still access information. And if private media companies act in ways that I disagree with, that's okay because they're private companies. This is the brilliance of the tyranny of liberal democracy because we are living under one of the greatest tyrannies that the world has ever seen. And people don't recognize it because it isn't in their face. It isn't necessarily the dictator or the door-to-door -door confiscations that we were taught about. No, it's not as obvious. This is because liberal democracy teaches its subjects that dangerous power is always concentrated. But liberal democracy avoids that because we have the three branches of government, checks and balances. We have private media companies. We have private companies. We vote for all of these things, whether that's with our dollars or with our ballots. And because we have therefore consented to these things, they are just. And this is the key distinction. We are not dealing with concentrated power. This sort of like Saturday morning cartoon concept of one guy and all his henchmen wielding power over us, that's not it. We are dealing with ideological power, which is cumulatively wielded throughout society. It is not concentrated and it doesn't have to be. It can be compartmentalized and people will feel, they will feel okay about this because they confuse compartmentalization with deconcentration, but that's not what it is. You can have 10,000 troops spread out a little bit more. But if they're all under the same flag and there's no opposition, you're screwed. And that's our problem right now. We don't have privatized power competing with state power. We don't have within the state, uh, the, the Congress competing with the executive branch. None of it is competing. Every relevant institution in this country that has power is wielding it under the same flag. They're wearing the same uniform. It is ideological power and it is being wielded against you. And they are allowed to do this because it is not as obvious as arresting you or executing you. That's what dictators do and you don't live under a dictator. But the effects are basically the same. On paper, it's all the same. If you go against the narratives of the regime, you're not going to be like disappeared or something, but you will be kicked out from the public square. Your family and friends will hate you. You'll lose your job. State adjacent paramilitary forces will attack you and nothing will be done about it. You'll be kicked out of school. You won't be able to open up a bank account or take out a loan. For all intents and purposes, it is the same. But we think that it isn't because of a very little and insignificant difference. Instead of the state operating under a dictator controlling all of these things in society and punishing you if you don't comply, it is now the state and all of these private companies and institutions operating under the exactly same ideology, doing the exactly same thing to you. And this is because it was never about the dictator. It was always about the ideology. It was always about the narrative. You're taught in public school that these crazy people just all of a sudden woke up and, and were dictators and there were these crazy things and they just wanted to do it and have power over people for no reason and they were mean. And you were taught that so that when the same tyranny occurs to you in your country, you don't notice it because there's not one guy to point at and go, hey, He's a, he's a dictator, isn't he? It's not about the dictator. It's about the narrative he represents. Our system removes the tyrant, but still crams the narrative down your throat every second that you are awake, no matter where you go. And this is the biggest problem of the enlightenment. The biggest flaw is the democratic part, the part where we assume that the individual is actually capable of being a free thinker. That is absurd and so demonstrably untrue. 95% of people will believe what they are told for their entire lives without questioning a word of it because they don't care. They don't actually care about thinking critically. And most of them don't even have the biological infrastructure necessary to do so in the first place. Like as long as the masses can wake up and have reasonable access to food, sex, and entertainment, they will not question anything. There is a reason 
reason that the profile of the average American is an overweight, porn-addicted Netflix subscriber. You just give the masses just enough to distract and sedate them, because otherwise they realize the state of their condition. Maybe they start asking questions. Maybe they start asking why they can't afford a home, why they can't start a family, why they were coerced into becoming a debt slave, why they just witnessed the greatest transfer of wealth in human history. All of these questions. Maybe they start to feel a bit sad and they talk to someone in the field of psychology, which operates under the flag of the ruling ideology. And psychology says, yeah, you just have a chemical imbalance. This is perfectly natural. Rates of prescription drug use, suicide and depression have always been this high, actually. But people just didn't talk about it back then because of uh, opens textbook, social constructs or whatever. Here, take these feel normal pills. Then you become a zombie who feels nothing as opposed to something bad, which might compel you to realize how completely backwards and terrible everything is. But here's something you have to realize. They do not need to control the guns if they control the information, if they control what's inside of you, what's in your head. They don't need to take the guns. They will let terrorists come to your house and kill you. And if you defend yourself, then you will be prosecuted. Let's be honest, though, they're not even going to cover it or even care if the mob gets to you before you can load in another PMAG. So you'll either be dead or in jail. Or best case scenario, you will have legal debt that takes you your entire life to pay off, but no one will hire you to earn money to pay that debt off because they're afraid of acting against the narratives too. They don't need to take the guns because they know that the guns are your token of freedom. They're a prop. As long as the American people have their guns, they will believe that they are free. So it's a much better strategy to just wait for them to have to use them to defend themselves from the consequences of the regime narratives and then just send them to jail, drown them in legal debt. Don't take them. If you try to take them, then that risks people realizing just how bad things really are. The other thing that the state doesn't have to do is suppress media. The state operating under an ideology doesn't have to suppress the media because the media companies operating under the same ideology will do it for them because they're all on the same team and that team is against you. And very recently, the right has actually started to realize that censorship by communists is bad, regardless of whether it's the private companies or the state doing it. But we had to cut through a lot of, well, that's a private company, start your own web browser, all that nonsense from the smug narrative servants in the process. So the question becomes, when are we going to realize that implicit power is just as bad as explicit power? Actually, it's worse because it hides in the shadows. It's less obvious. It's harder to detect. When are we going to realize this? I don't think we will until the whole thing collapses, to be honest. But let me explain what I mean by that. But first, <clears throat> you knew this was coming. Did someone say collapse? It's time to start your Christmas shopping. The first item on your list needs to be iTarget Pro. This revolutionary system allows you to dry fire practice with your actual firearm and the comfort, safety, and privacy of your own home. In other words, without dealing with FUDs gun jannies, and the ATF. What more could you ask for? The cost of ammo is through the roof, you know this, but it's okay because this gives law-abiding gun owners a better way to train regularly. No more inconvenient trips to the range or expensive practice ammunition. Just download iTarget's proprietary app, load the laser bullet into your firearm, and start your dry fire training experience, which helps develop muscle memory, sharpens target reaction speed, sight alignment, trigger function, and more. iTarget Pro comes in all the major calibers, including 223 for your AR, so that you can stay sharp with almost any firearm. So go to iTargetPro.com right now, save 10% plus, get free shipping with the offer code DOYLE. This is the smartest way for you to practice, and it pays for itself literally in one day. That's the letter itargetpro.com, itargetpro.com, offer code DOYLE, very epic, but we continue. We were just talking about examples of implicit power versus explicit power, whether we were ever going to realize that they're both bad for us. And I want to talk about a concept that was introduced by Machiavelli regarding two types of political operatives, which he described as lions and foxes. So put into almost criminally basic terms, the lion uses strength to achieve ends, while the fox uses cunning to achieve ends. These are not unfailingly without overlap in terms of individual actors, but I'm going to be speaking about these within the modern context in a way that is also congruent with the understanding of right-wing and left-wing people that you're familiar with if you watch the show. So in the modern context, the lion is the conservative. He values God, tradition, order, his nation, etc. But he hasn't used his strength because he doesn't understand the threat that he's being faced with yet. And he doesn't understand how much power he's lost to the foxes. But an important distinction to be made between the two in the modern context is that the lion isn't necessarily not cunning because he doesn't know how to be, but more often because he purposefully elects not to be cunning because he assumes that his enemies are not actually his enemies and or that they are acting in good faith or that to be cunning is to sacrifice sacred principles, etc. That's the line. 
The fox in the modern context is the left-wing individual. They don't value tradition or God or nation. They value progress. They value tolerance and being nice, etc. But they're different from the lion because their use of cunning is not necessarily out of choice, but rather necessity. Because foxes and liberals tend to be weaker, more feminine, more insecure, more mentally ill. It's so true. All those things. They are intimidated by strength and competition because they cannot contend with it. So instead, they use deception. They use manipulation. That's how they achieve their ends. They manipulate information. The lions, they're outdated. They're out of touch. We know better now. We don't need those things anymore. That's the only way that you can reduce or handicap the lions. You eliminate all of the things that they would be inclined to defend. You remove from the mainstream conversation any concept of God, of nation, of family, of heritage, of culture, all of it, because the lion cannot act if he feels as though he has nothing to defend. So the foxes gain and maintain their power through cunning and guile. They manipulate narratives, they manipulate the truth, all to convince you through brainwashing that the system is good. It should exist, and our people are the ones who should be running it, whereas the lions would just take power regardless. So the fox teaches you in public education that the dictators of days past, well, they were lions who used force. And they do this to you so that you don't detect the ways in which they have power over you now, because they control your mind, and therefore they control your reality. And if not yours, then those of the masses, which makes no difference since the masses vote based off how the regime defines reality, which justifies the existence and the actions of the regime, all of which end up affecting your immediate reality, regardless of whether you can think and operate for yourself, because you still live in that society and therefore under that system. Now, that being said, given that the fox's power tends to be implicit, it's less obvious than explicit power, it also tends to be less immediately secure because foxes themselves tend to be insecure, which means that they're always going to be seeking forms of additional soft power to wield over the population, whether that's regime narratives being introduced into advertising or popular culture or even something as symbolic as participating in a mass ritual, anything to let them know that you're in compliance and to let you know that, hey, this is what we're doing. This is what's happening. It's in your face. You're not escaping it anytime soon. These are things like uh, demoralization tactics, humiliation rituals, etc., all designed to remind you through soft power that you are subject to the ideological tyranny of the regime, which is just as imposing in your day-to-day -day life, and actually even more so in many cases than the definition of tyranny that they taught you to be afraid of in public school. But the problem with this is that what the narrative says is happening does not often match reality, and so the narrative is always adjusting and having to explain itself. And it's allowed to do that because the masses are stupid and they lack agency. That's why we point and laugh when we see these people saying things, you know, in January 2020, and then in 2021, the next year, January, they're saying the completely opposite thing. And it's like, yeah, it's funny, but that's not the takeaway. The takeaway is that they literally cannot understand the difference. And we have to understand that. It's not that they're hypocrites. It's that they're lemmings. They're sheep. And you're going to have to figure out how to work within that reality before it's too late, frankly. But yeah, so as the narratives get more and more complex, they naturally start to lose contact with reality and everything becomes so cloudy and confusing. So then they start compensating for that by assuring you that all of this nonsense, which goes against your instincts and better judgment, it's all being promoted by the experts and science, etc. But ultimately, what's going to happen is they will lose contact with the reality of what it takes to maintain power, whether that's domestically or on the global scale, because they get too caught up in their own nonsense. And remember, all all of the education that you received from the state is a part of that narrative, and it's all self-justifying. Even this idea of, oh, well, knowledge is power. No, it's not. What does that even mean? That's what you hear in school, but it's not true. Your knowledge of the vocab terms of the regime narratives is not power, but them forcing you to know those vocab terms in order to participate in society, that's power. Oh, well, there's not total media censorship like under real tyranny. It doesn't matter. There doesn't have to be, and they know that. You personally can access information and do your own research because you're smart. You think for yourself, but the masses don't. They aren't capable of doing that. But guess what? Their vote counts just as much as yours does. And it's those votes that justify all of the changes in society that do and will affect you directly. It is literally the equivalent of you going into a classroom as an adult and the teacher says, okay, kids, uh, put up your hands to vote. We can either eat celery sticks or goldfish. But remember, the goldfish are poison. And you're like, this is ridiculous. Goldfish are not poison. They are the snack that smiles back. I can't believe she thinks we would buy into, oh, they're putting their hands up. They're putting their hands up for celery sticks. And guess what you're eating? Celery sticks. There's actually, that's not even true. Like there's much worse stuff going on in classrooms. Like that's actually significantly more believable than what kids are being taught now. But still, the lion loses power to the foxes. The foxes reduce and handicap the lions. Then they use implicit force to maintain their power in society. And this is how a liberal democracy functions. And it's not sustainable. And collapse is inevitable.
And you can actually map out this trend pretty clearly following World War II. Remember, we talked about this earlier in the series, and now it's all coming together because you've got the post-World War II intellectual trends that sought to strip man of any sense of identity or understanding of the truth, which might compel him to fight for something. Then you weaken him by destroying masculinity, subsidizing poisonous food, poisoning the water supply, et cetera, et cetera. Now you've got all the men who would be lions feeling as though they have nothing to defend and no physical means of doing so, even if they did. And then the foxes rise to power. Slowly, the regime narratives drift further from reality. The regime destabilizes. Total collapse unavoidable. We've talked about this before, but there is no such thing as a coalition of people who are this unstable, this degenerate, this removed from reality, this godless, and this prideful who have ever been or could ever be successful in the long run. Like, total collapse is unavoidable, and you just have to make sure that you're out of the blast radius. But you need God for that. You need to turn to God, and you need to put your faith in him. And maybe if the country would have been better at that earlier, then we wouldn't have gotten to this point in the first place. You don't believe me? Okay, think about it. How did we get to this point? How did this happen? Why didn't the Second Amendment prevent this? Why didn't the whole Constitution prevent this? How can you still honestly put your faith into those concepts, having had the last two years of the American experience affect you? Look at what God-given rights look like in a country that has abandoned God. A hundred million gun owners and 400 million guns during the greatest tyranny in the history of our country, the history of this continent, and no one did a damn thing about it. Your business had to collapse. You had to miss your father's funeral. You had to stay inside and watch America's greatest cities burn to the ground by the actions of anti-American terrorists and then watch nothing be done about it because the state was too busy going after people who tried to defend themselves during it or maybe even going after parents at school board meetings. But still, there's a story in recent history, relatively speaking, about a group of men with horses and black powder rifles who fought off the most powerful and sophisticated military in the history of the world because they believed in God. Well, what does that have to do with it? Everything. It has everything to do with it. Maybe you're ready to go take these people on right now without God, but that's not enough. It is about the soul of the nation. And by the way, this is not a call to arms, not a call for violence. I disavow all of that. I am simply analyzing a cope. I am so tired of hearing about the Second Amendment when I know for a fact that we're living under tyranny right now, and we have been for a while, and it's only going to get worse from here, and the same people who are too lazy to go to church or even go door knocking for an authentically right-wing congressional candidate want to just sit back and fantasize about some scenario where they fight off the government, one, they're never going to establish an explicit tyranny because they don't need to in order to control you like we just talked about, right? We just talked about this. And two, even if they did, you would do nothing about it. And that's because nobody believes in anything anymore. If you do not know God, then you fear death. Everybody's an atheist until the plane starts to go down. You fear accepting the reality of your own impermanence. You fear what happens after you die. And so you cling to life and you will do anything. You will put up with anything to remain in a state of comfort. You can't possibly invest your life in the very literal sense into your country if you believe that it's all you've got, that there's nothing afterwards, that you're not a part of something greater than yourself, especially when that society has made it difficult for you to find a wife and to start a family. Like who would you even be fighting for? What is there even to fight for? Nobody believes in anything. It is not enough to be well-armed. We're not even well-armed. We are the most armed. It is actually like stupid how many guns we have, like in a good way, but still, like it's not enough. I would be more afraid of a population with sticks who still have spirit than I would be of a population of men with the most sophisticated firearms on the market, but who don't have spirit. Want to see a recent example? Look at what happened in Afghanistan. Those men simply retreated into the mountains. They waited. And when their time came, they dusted off the old Soviet mass-produced AKs, and they took their country back from an illegitimate regime with access to the best weaponry and resources in the world. And they did it practically overnight. Why? Because they believed in a god, a false god. But still, it's about the spirit of the nation. Just like we talked about in the last video, you are either living for God or you are living for yourself. And no man who is living for himself is ever going to sacrifice a decadent and superfluously comfortable lifestyle under this system to fight for good and against evil. And again, not calling for violence. If you think that's what I'm doing, you are being dishonest. What I am saying is actually more important than that because it gets to the root of all of our problems because we have abandoned the immaterial for the material and we call this progress. We are standing on the shoulders of giants and we think that we are flying. The constitution can only function for a religious people. This is not vague. I say again, the constitution can only function for a religious people. A religious people are not a people who have abandoned God and the immaterial. I am now going to explain why the constitution 
constitution can only function for a religious people, but if you are a conservative, you seek to conserve the traditional American society, which was rooted in Christianity. You seek to conserve the constitution as the framework from which our country embarks, which the framers wrote could only function for a religious, read, Christian people. And then you watch the video that we just did proving that the global left is the political force of Satanism. And it's like, how can you not be a Christian? How can you not? I'm now the guy that I used to roll my eyes at, but it's so obvious. Once you see it, it cannot be unseen. Give it a try. Tell me I'm wrong. I will literally give you a Bible. I will literally give you the writings of C.S. Lewis, Chesterton. I, and I actually mean that. Like, we'll talk about that at the end of the video. But the point is that I would like to get as many of us into heaven as possible. But in the meantime, even if you don't believe in that, Christianity is the only way forward if you actually want to conserve this country. And if you're not into it, you feel weird praying, you feel weird going to church, like that's normal. But it is the only way forward because you cannot say, a nation that has no spirit, that doesn't believe it should exist, that doesn't believe that it's good, and that doesn't believe that fighting for good will be rewarded. But let's talk about the Constitution now. Uh, if you know anything about the Constitution, then you probably heard that it was this revolutionary document brilliantly crafted to limit the power of government to prevent tyranny and maximize freedom so long as we follow it diligently. That is the mythos of the Constitution. Like, that's the story surrounding it. And any honest person will concede in regard to the Constitution something to the effect of, yeah, it's not a perfect system. You know, every system is going to have its flaws. Okay, well, then let's acknowledge them. The problem isn't necessarily the Constitution in itself, but rather that we decided to put our faith into a piece of paper rather than God. And let me explain what that means. I forgot who said this. It was someone very smart a very long time ago, but they said that there is no such thing as a nation of laws. That is correct. Like throughout history and especially under our current system, whoever is in charge is always going to selectively enforce the written laws. You know, they're going to go after certain people or certain institutions and then forget to go after others. They're going to manipulate semantics to make laws that were written 60 years ago, aligned with the current narratives by redefining words, et cetera, et cetera. And this is because politics above all, else is just about doing favors for your friends and punishing your enemies. And I'm sorry if that makes you uncomfortable, but 30 years from now, you will thank me. The point being, every law that exists seeks to compel individual behavior, whether that's a speed limit or a law saying that you can't kill people. And like all of those laws are making some form of moral declaration, even if only in a small capacity. These laws are trying to act as this like sort of algorithm to correct for deviations in human behavior, which are immoral. Now, here's the problem. The left is actually right when they say that the constitution is just an old piece of paper. It is. But what they want to do is throw it out and replace it with something new, something that reflects their religion. And it is a religion, but at least that acknowledges the immaterial. There's a reason that all of these old societies were obsessed with weird sexual rituals and child sacrifice because they know that it blurred the lines between our world and demons from which they could extract power. My point is that the constitution of a society, like literally what constitutes that society, cannot just be a legal document. It cannot just be a piece of paper. Something has to predate and transcend that. There has to be something immaterial from which to draw, from which to be inspired when writing your founding documents. And our piece of paper has failed because what mattered most and what we failed to take into account is that the men who wrote that document acknowledged the immaterial, that the document was written for a religious people, that we all have God-given rights, but slowly over time, the men who were in charge of enforcing that document became gradually less concerned with the immaterial and more concerned with the material and with themselves. And since there is no such thing as a nation of laws, the men who are enforcing that constitution have to be connected to the same immaterial sense that the men who wrote it were and the people over whom that document and group have authority have to be as well or else it's not going to work. That's what the word constitution means. It means this document reflects our society. It reflects our people. If everybody in our society is blue, it's going to include that because that is us. That's who we are. And as our people have abandoned that immaterial sense that formed the constitution of our society, both in terms of population and legal framework, yeah, of course, the document's not going to save us from that. But instead of focusing on bringing people back to that immaterial sense, we just cried, no, look at this piece of paper. It's cool. Believe what it says. No, it's not. Sorry, it's not cool. No one gets that excited looking at the piece of paper. You know what is cool? Banishing Lucifer and his army from heaven because you are just that powerful. Retaking the Holy Land with the fellas. Being so strong in your conviction that you refuse to make a sacrifice to a false god and so you get hacked to death by children. That's cool. Fighting off the British Empire is cool. But all of those things are only possible through the acknowledgement of the divine, of the immaterial, of good, and of all of the things which justify the Constitution. Because without God, the Constitution is literally just a piece of paper. Without God, it is meaningless both in theory and in practice. And how could it not be? How are you supposed to have God given rights if you don't acknowledge God. And in practice, as we've just covered, 
You can't sustain the legal constitution if it's contingent upon the demographic constitution being one of faith and of piety. The paper constitution is downstream from the literal constitution of the people, and progressives are right with the whole living document thing, but conservatives lose because they think that all that matters is preserving the document in itself. But they fail to wield the power necessary to preserve the people that would enable the functionality of that document and of that society. Oh, but John, couldn't it function if, if we just depatriated everyone who disagrees with it? Now you're talking. Now you're talking. But seriously, the true constitution of a society comes from the immaterial. If not God, something else will fill the hole in the hearts of society because man is a religious animal. There is a God-sized hole in the heart of this country and something is going to fill it. The legal algorithm to constitute the society can only correct for slight deviations. And if the society by and large rejects it, then it's not going to work. And if the society accepts a new religion, then your old algorithm is already on its way out the door. And that's exactly what's happening to us right now because religion is inevitable. People want to you know, reject Christianity or broadly speaking religion because they think it's outdated. They perceive it to be low class. That's their pride. But if you ask them what they think about existence, they will reveal to you that they're actually very religious, whether they're spiritual, you know, it's astrology, whatever it is. They all have explanations of how the universe and existence work and, and why we're here. That's religion. And our government, our institutions, they all claim to be secular, but they're not. No, they have a new religion. And in terms of how it's enforced on society, it's actually no different from like a theocracy other than it being more subtle. But you look at the way these people take to the streets, the way that they dedicate their lives to these causes. We talked about this earlier, how they derive their meaning and their purpose from them, the way they participate in the rituals, the idol worship. And it's like, yeah, yeah, that's religion. But it's a material religion, which is worship of the self because it worships earthly and material gratification, which of course is Satanism, as we discussed in the last video, or as the old religion, the immaterial religion. That implied something greater than us, something immaterial which would of course be God. And so they simply transformed the immaterial into the material to usher away our beautiful country away from God and towards the devil. The priests are replaced with scientists and psychologists, the experts who tell you how the world really is. This is what's really going on. And the state defines truth fluidly with whatever is in accordance with its ideology and narrative at the time. And it uses these, these experts to corroborate that. And it censors anything that challenges it. It really is crystal clear. Like to allow for evil, you have to take attention away from the immaterial and turn it to the material, which is exactly what they've done. But even evil doesn't mean anything anymore. Everything is subjective. Think about it. When people use the word evil nowadays, they're basically just saying like someone that is like really mean. They have no concept of evil that is more sophisticated than like one who is mean, one who does not let others enjoy. And that's because good and evil are spiritual terms. They call back to the immaterial. They acknowledge it. And because of that, they are now regarded as archaic, outdated, low class, backwards, unprogressive. We know better than that now. We have science now. Science says this. Science says that. Science says, look at this study about hormones and synapses and neurochemicals. And it's like, okay, but then you get away from the papers and the lab coats and you look at the results of all of this and it becomes really, really hard to not recognize child sacrifice when you see it. Like, why do you think it always comes back to your children? Why is that? Whether it's directly or even corrupting them in schools, throughout every aspect of media, why? Your brain has been trained and conditioned to only think of things in terms of the material. And so you're like, well, surely there must be some explanation. You know, what does the science say? There must be a study for this. No, no, it's simply that they want your kids. That's it. They literally just want your kids. They worship themselves and they hate God. And God hates the shedding of innocent blood. And the destruction of children and their innocence is the ultimate protest against God. And it always has been. These people worship demons, but because, well, I have a study, it must be different from when it was happening thousands of years ago, right? There's nothing more beautiful than a child and his innocence. And because they hate beauty, they seek to destroy that. And so now what's happening is many people just like us are starting to think about these things. They can't quite put their finger on it, but they can tell that something is deeply wrong here. These are people who maybe never really took religion seriously but they are gradually realizing that they have allowed for basically this evil to infiltrate their society. They can't name it exactly, but they know it when they see it. And this is because we all were relaxed in this false comfort of moral neutrality. And then very dark and ancient things have returned and we're not prepared for this. We don't exactly know how to handle it. And we're definitely not prepared for what's gonna happen next. But this is what happens. The so-called secular state was a lie and it has invited all of the evil and problems back into the world that we had forgotten existed thanks to nightly Christianity, which we took for granted. And now, 
any moral instincts that remain in this society are being channeled through that so-called secular state en route to complete and total immorality. We're in this purgatory state where we still kind of know right from wrong, but it's being sucked out of us to cement us into this material state because morality, right from wrong, that can only exist when we acknowledge the immaterial, when we acknowledge God. It isn't possible in the naturalist and material ideology which currently rules over us. If you do not acknowledge God, if you do not acknowledge a creator who would have the authority over all of us to declare what is right and what is wrong, then everything is relative. Then you don't have value. Every time you've ever laughed with your best friends or hugged your parents or listened to your favorite music or got stared at by a baby in public or watched the sunset, none of that matters. You don't have value. You're carbon. You're molecules. You don't have a soul. You can't think. That's all just neurons firing, bro. It's science, bro. If you do not acknowledge the immaterial, then that is what you believe. Maybe you haven't thought this like through to this extent, but these are the logical conclusions of your beliefs, of the naturalist worldview. Without God, we're just molecules. If I painted the heck off commie sign with my brain matter, that would be the metaphysical equivalent of if I just spilled a glass of water, or I, I hit the Jesus bobblehead because it's all molecules moving around, man. Science, man, it's, different, it's just different types of matter. That's what that means. And nobody actually believes that. They pretend because it fuels and justifies the rejection of God, but nobody actually believes that. Deep down, we know right from wrong, and we know that we have purpose. But society has been purposefully structured such that you are made to forget that, to forget right from wrong, forget that you do have a purpose, but we know it's true. And when we break that conditioning, when we liberate ourselves from the vices that demoralize us, we know it's true. And that's why I advocate so heavily for young men to practice the Christian virtues on this channel, because it is absolutely necessary for young men to practice those virtues if they are going to successfully take their country back. And people often think like, oh, the Bible just says things for no reason, and then they don't follow the Bible, and then all these old problems that they'd forgotten about start to surface and then they're like oh no bro so i try to explain why these virtues should be followed other than just because they're in the bible but every time i give a speech um, i was at the catholic university of america a couple weeks ago i was just at texas christian university we're planning more events now but every time i'm at one of these events i always spend about a half hour afterwards talking to all the young guys in attendance and you look at these guys and you, you just see it in their eyes. They really believe that they are going to change the world. And it is the most beautiful thing, the most inspiring thing that you will ever see because it's true. And that's why discipline is so important because this society wants to suck that sense of hope and optimism out of you to make you pacified and apathetic. And we can't let that happen. That's why I love our seven percenters, but the boys will always be my favorite because these are the guys who are going to change the world. If anybody can turn this around, it is these guys because they still have that sense of hope in their eyes. They don't have the fluoride stare yet. They have haven't allowed for the world to beat them into despair yet. And that is so important. Never let them break you. And if you practice the Christian virtues, then they won't be able to. So do that. But that's also why they want to destroy the innocence of children, because then they grow up to be like these mentally ill, you know, people. They sympathize with the victim narratives of the state. And so they pledge allegiance to it. But yeah, figure it out, big guy. We're all going to die. Your time is going to come. You likely won't expect it, but there will be a moment when you realize that you don't get to see what happens next in this world and everyone else will continue on without you. So it's probably best to get yourself sorted out now so that you don't regret it for eternity. Plus, that's like the only way that our country actually has a chance. And we discussed this more in the previous video, how Christian virtues are what builds societies, which is why the greatest societies in the history of the world have been Christian. And the opposites of those virtues, which are promoted by the left and loved by Satan, are what destroys societies. So I don't want to repeat myself here, but yeah, um, you should go watch all the other videos in the series, which I will put links to in the description. But I will summarize here what we talked about. Conservatism requires Christianity. Without Christianity, you will just be slowing inevitable decline and degeneration. Everything required to conserve our country, which used to be so great and still could be so great once again, morality, sacrifice, community, family, spirit, the constitution, freedom, all of those things are only possible through the acknowledgement of God and the immaterial. Abandoning God and the immaterial does not make them go away. It just makes it unable to protect you from the evil which you've now invited into every facet of society, basically. Like we all know America was built upon Christian values, so now it's time to act like it. And if you're looking for a place to start, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis really is the best place. Sometimes people get mad at me when I say that, like, oh, you should be telling people to read the Bible. Yeah, but honestly, the average person really isn't ready to just like open up Genesis and start reading, you know? Like in my opinion, it's better to start with something written in simpler language, but we can do both. So if you can't afford a copy of Mere Christianity, which is really short, simple read, gives the best introduction to Christianity in my opinion, you can finish it in an afternoon. Or if you can't afford a Bible for whatever reason, maybe you can't afford them, you just don't really want to buy them, that's fine too, I guess. I'll make a deal with you. 
Buy a copy of either of them or both and send an email to heckoffsatan at gmail.com. Attach a picture of your receipt, a picture of the physical copies of the books in your possession. Maybe tear the receipt in half for good measure and then put your Venmo information uh, and I will reimburse you for that. So go to a bookstore, order it online, you know, show me when they're delivered, whatever. Do what you got to do. I will reimburse you for them as long as you promise me that you're actually going to read them sincerely. And I really hope you're being sincere because if you're deceiving me, I cannot imagine a scenario where that plays out well for you in the end. So, you know, my gift to you all, if you're interested, send an email to heckoffsatan at gmail.com. I will reimburse you so long as you actually and sincerely read them. And think about what we talked about today. But um, I am going to remind you, I am but a simple demonetized right-wing e-boy. So if you send me an email, make sure you really can't get one yourself. It's only like 10 bucks. So yes, thank you for watching. I had fun. You guys are all right. You're a good group. I like you. You guys are all right. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up. I will wait so that you actually do it. Okay, now leave it a comment. Make it witty. Make it insightful. Make it, you know, a timestamp with one of your favorite moments. Maybe you have multiple favorite moments. It's really up to you. The world is your oyster. Um, you have free will. This is true. But can you be trusted with it? I think that you can. You're a good guy. We talked about this. And then, of course, you know, thumbs up. Hey, guys, you like this video? Leave a thumbs up. So leave a comment. Subscribe to the channel. You hit that button, it says subscribe. You turn on post notifications to get notified in the event that I post, which will be so much more frequent. You're not even ready for it, actually. Like, literally, you are not. When I said after I took that break that we have to microdose John Doyle so as to not, like, overload, people didn't, I guess, process that fully because then they're, like, mad at me for not posting as much as I used to. I'm a man of, <laughs> literally, I'm a man of my word. Uh, so there will be more content, though. But anyways... Um, and then, of course, share the video with a friend. What I mean, it's the holiday season. It's about giving. What more could you give to your friend than an insightful, important, dense breakdown of the indissoluble link between conservatism and Christianity? Maybe a copy of Mere Christianity, you know, maybe a copy of the Bible. I'm giving that stuff out because... I'm a fan of the boys. I am a fan of the boys. Take that out of context. <laughs> I'm a fan of the boys. It's true. I love the boys. The women, you know, you know, there's necessity there. There is. Um, big fan of women. Cherish women, but the boys are going to be the ones to take the country back. And so we got to sympathize with them a little bit more than our beloved, our cherished, our beautiful, our magnificent seven percenters, so many wonderful young women, so many wonderful mothers, so many wonderful grandmothers. I see your comments. Thank you. And you know what? We're even bringing back the two-minute outro. In the spirit of the conclusion of the series, we're bringing it back. The two-minute outro. The greatest part of the video. My brain is like in a mode where it's just like sending out all this information. And then when it stops having information to send out, the vehicle is still accelerating. And so then I just start saying nonsense. And we just keep it going. And the, the boys love it. It's epic. Anyways. <clears throat> Thank you so much for watching. May God bless America. We're excited for Christmas. Yes.